A History of the Yoruba People S. Adabanji Akindi The Great Oyo Empire The Kingdom of Oyoila is regarded in Yoruba traditions as one of the younger of the early Yoruba kingdoms. It is believed to have been founded considerably later than such kingdoms as Ketu, Ou, and Ila. However, by the 17th century, Oyoila had become the greatest of all Yoruba kingdoms richer, stronger, and territorially very much larger than any other. By the 18th century, its capital city of Oyoila, known to its northern house and neighbors as Katunga, was the center of an empire comprising most of northern and western Yoruba land as well as substantial territories of non-Yoruba peoples like the Noop, the Bariba and the Asia. During the 18th century, armies of the Ilafin of Oyo were pushing far westwards beyond the Asia country, defeating at least one army of the Ashanti kingdom in parts of what is now the Republic of Togo, most probably in the country of the Yoruba Itsha and Ife of modern Togo Republic. Now known to history as the Old Oyo Empire, the Ilafin's empire was the largest ever in the history of the tropical forests and grasslands of West Africa south of the Niger. What circumstances or factors were responsible for advancing Oyoila? initially a small kingdom located in the extreme northwestern corner of Yorubland, to such military power, such territorial expansion and such greatness. One factor, without doubt, was adversity. The location that the founders of Oyoila chose for their kingdom turned out to be a very difficult one. Before it had had time to establish roots, the small kingdom was attacked relentlessly from many directions. The principal enemies were the Bariba of the Borgu country to the northwest, and the Noop to the northeast both of them formidable peoples of the banks of the Niger. This was, in short, frontier territory between the Yoruba and these peoples, for some time both of them had been attacking Yoruba settlers in the region and forcing them to move southwards. Older Yoruba kingdoms in the region Ketu, Ou and Dila had encountered the Bariba and Noop hostility. Both Ketu and Ou had been forced to abandon their original locations and relocate at some distance to the south. Ila would not relocate southwards but it was compelled to move its capital town from location to location in search of safety. The location chosen for Oyoila had yet another problem. It was, as its later history would show, a very desirable spot on the oldest routes connecting the Trans-Niger grasslands and the forests of central West Africa across the Middle Niger. That meant that many groups of people had some interest in the area and would fight to uphold their interests. That included various Bariba and Noop groups as well as the older kingdom of Ou from the south. In short, the location of Oyoila was like the eye of the whirlwind that would not subside. Buffeted relentlessly by Bariba and Noop groups, the infant kingdom agreed to pay tribute to some of them at certain times. Threatened also by Ou from the south, Oyoila paid tribute to the Olau for some time. To survive at all, Oyoila needed to be not just strong, but so overwhelmingly strong as to be able to overcome and suppress its enemies. Mostly learning from those enemies, Oyoila built a military establishment that became the terror of all its neighbors and conquered many kingdoms and peoples. Like some other significant Yoruba frontier kingdoms, notably Ketu, Ila and Owo, Oyoila survived its initial frontier afflictions and prospered, unlike them, it went on to build the largest empire south of the Niger. A second factor was the good natural defenses of Oyoil's ultimate site. After the kingdom's early relocations, it finally returned to settle on the site that was destined to be its home until the 1830s. The site lay under the protection of a range of rocky hills, which afforded it considerable security. Richard Lander described as follows his first sight of Oyoila, by then a great city, in January 1826. On attaining the summit of a lofty ridge, we came in sight of the city of Katunga, lying to the south of us, at the base of a granite mountain, and apparently embosomed in beautiful trees. Between the ridge and the city was a fertile valley, highly cultivated, and extending to the westward as far as the eye could reach, while the view to the eastward was bounded by a granite rock, shivered into fragments, and at no great distance from the place on which we stood. After the kingdom had built great city walls, taking advantage of these natural defenses, the city that emerged was widely regarded by neighbors as impregnable. For over two centuries, no enemy came even close to directly threatening the city. Thirdly, the region in which Oyoila was established was one of the most favorable for agriculture in West Africa. This was the Yoruba savanna grassland or savanna low woodland, see chapter 9, gently undulating, with occasional low hills and rock outcrops. Its high points formed a watershed territory from which streams flowed either south to the Asin and other south-flowing rivers, or north to the river Niger, making the whole area a well-watered region. Its soils were among the most fertile in Yoruba land. Very prosperous farming in these circumstances made for rapid population increases in the Oyoila kingdom and the Oyo country around it. By probably as early as the late 15th century, 
the Oyo country was the most thickly populated part of Yoruba land and had a disproportionate share of its heavily populated cities and towns. Once the Ilafan had established varying types of overlordship over all the kingdoms, cities and towns of the Oyo country, he ruled over a large and prosperous area from which he could almost endlessly draw men and material resources into his armies. These armies grew bigger and stronger, until they became all-conquering. Fourthly, the largely open grassland nature of the Oyo country and all the Yoruba and Asia countries to the west of it greatly assisted the growth of an empire. Employing horses in the open grasslands, Oyo Ila came to control far-flung communications, establish far-flung administrative and commercial networks, and send armies to subdue and control very distant lands. At the peak of the power of the old Oyo Empire, its officials spread out from the Noop country on the middle Niger all the way southwestwards to the coast of what are now the Lagos state of Nigeria and Benin Republic, and westwards all the way into the modern Dogo Republic. Fifthly, Oyo Ila lay on, and in the end controlled, the most important trade routes across the middle Niger. It was therefore in a position to dominate most of the trade between Yoruba land, the Asia country and much of West Africa south of the Niger on one side, and the Trans-Niger countries, the Sahara and the Mediterranean world on the other. This was an enormous source of wealth to the kingdom and to its citizens. Very importantly also, Oyo Ila came to control the importation of horses from beyond the Niger, from Hausaland and from Bornu, a factor that contributed most to its military superiority. Finally, Oyo Ila enjoyed all the benefits of being a kingdom of the Yoruba people, the largest single people in the West African forests, occupying more territory than any other people of the region. Oyo Ila never extended its control over large areas of Yoruba land especially the southern and easternmost parts. But its people were Yoruba and, therefore, all of the homeland was theirs to trade, travel, do business, and reside in at will. Its king, the Ilafin, was a member of the Yoruba family of kings and, as his power grew, his influence was enhanced by the fact that all other Yoruba kings regarded him as their fortunate and powerful brother. Yoruba people commonly said that nobody could ever get more fortunate than the Ilafin, Akilori Irjulafin Oyo, and a Yoruba person bragging about his fame or popularity would commonly use the hyperbole, Ilafin Oyo Momi the Ilafin of Oyo knows me. There is strong evidence in Yoruba traditions that, at the peak of the power of the Ilafin's empire, Yoruba kings, in general, deferred to him in various ways including in the resolution of their internal and inter-kingdom difficulties. In far western Yoruba kingdoms, such as Ketu, which were independent of the Ilafin's authority, his armies, while campaigning in those parts against the Asia people, were regularly sure of hospitality, supplies and other types of support. The same would seem to have been true in the Orangans' kingdom of Ila for the Ilafin's armies campaigning against the Noop in the northeast. Every one of the other independent Yoruba kingdoms of the southern and eastern forests, Ijebuod, Owo, Ilesa, Ondo, the Akiti kingdoms, etc., ultimately developed some sort of strong ties with the Ilafin. Where his military and political power did not reach, that is, his membership of the large family of Yoruba kings extended his influence quite potently. Early Beginnings According to Yoruba traditions, the founder of the Oyo Ila kingdom was Ornmian, said to be one of the youngest grandsons of Odudua. The time of its foundation in the light of calculations done from lists of kings in various Yoruba local histories, was probably in the late 12th or early 13th century. Oyo traditions have very popular accounts of the founding of this kingdom, and so too do many traditions widespread in Yoruba land. Samuel Johnson recorded some of them in Oyo, Ibadan and other places in western and central Yoruba land in the 19th century. The core of these traditions is that Oranmian set off from Ila Ife and headed northwards. Samuel Johnson in his attempt to fit this northward migration into his own general theory that Yoruba people originated from the Middle East, wrote that Ornmian's purpose was to go to the Middle East to avenge the expulsion of his ancestors from Arabia. Oyo and other Yoruba traditions, however, simply have the Ornmian migration as an episode in the general story of the founding of Yoruba kingdoms. After Ornmian entered the country of the Oyo subgroup, where old Oyo settlements dotted grassland territory, he continued to the far northwest, to the frontier country near the Niger where small Oyo, Bariba and Noop settlements existed, closely interlocked. There, one Bariba chief helped him to locate a good place to settle. The story is that the Bariba chief gave him a charmed python that guided him to the location, unifying a few old settlements at that location, he began to establish his kingdom. He also married the daughter of a Noop chief, usually identified in the traditions with the name Alempe. The traditions indicate that the first years of the Oyo Ila kingdom were peaceful. But such a peaceful period did not last long. 
Oren Mian's friendship with one Bariba chief and his connection with the Noop chief by marriage did not prove sufficient to secure peace with all the Bariba and Noop groups. Oyo Ila was attacked repeatedly by various Bariba and Noop groups. The difficulties became so intense that Ornmian, himself a famous warrior prince, decided to move the base of the kingdom to a less troublesome site, at a place called Oko. At Oko, the kingdom had peace for some time. But then the need arose for Ornmian to return to Ila Ife. After installing his oldest son, Ajaka, on the throne, he left for Ila Ife. The traditions paint the time after Ornmian's departure as an extremely difficult period for the kingdom. Threats from the Ou kingdom in the south compelled it to start paying tribute to the Ola'u. Some of the stronger Bariba and Noop groups overran it and forced it to pay tribute. In fact, Ajaka appears to have been displaced for some time by these unforgiving enemies. At last, he stepped aside and gave the throne to his brother, Sango, son of Ornmian's Noop wife, who was believed by the chiefs to be the more warlike prince. With Sango as king, the situation began to improve. The secret of the military power of the Noop and Bariba was their use of cavalry. Sango embarked on buying horses from some of the Noop, his mother's people. When the Olau sent his officers to demand the tribute, Sango refused to pay. The Olau sent an army to compel him to pay, but Sango's men so decisively defeated the invaders as to silence the Ou threat once and for all. After that, Sango moved the base of the kingdom from Oko back to its original location. When the Bariba and Noop attacked, he fought them fiercely and beat back attack after attack, capturing many horses in the process. Sango's life was so filled with terrible battles and surprising victories that his subjects and enemies alike credited him with supernatural powers. Sango died in the prime of his life. One of the supernatural powers which he claimed himself was the power to make lightning. According to Oyo traditions, while demonstrating this power to his chiefs and courtiers one day, he accidentally burnt down the palace. Either out of embarrassment or out of fear of his subjects, he took his own life. But his people, out of gratitude for all he had done for their kingdom, deified him, giving his name to the god of thunder and lightning and set up shrines and rituals for his worship. The cult of Sango became the special cult of Oyoila kings, unlike in most Yoruba kingdoms where the cult of Ogun, god of iron and war, was the royal cult. The above is the best known and most widely accepted traditional account of the beginnings of Oyoila. However, there are some other less well-known accounts. One tradition recorded by E. M. Lee Jadu says that Oyo Ila was founded by a noop hunter from the noop town of Ogoto on the southern banks of the Niger. Another, recorded by Leo Frobenius during visits to Yoruba land, has it that there were two successive dynasties in early Oyo Ila, one originating from the noop and the other from the Bariba. Then too, there are suggestions by some historians that some details in the well-known Ornmian tradition itself are open to interpretations pointing to noop or Bariba founding of Oyo Ila. Thus it has been suggested that the story that a Bariba chieftain helped Ornmian to find the location at which to settle could mean that Bariba folks were in fact the founders of Oyoila, while the story of Ornmian's marriage to the daughter of a Noop chieftain could also support the claim of a Noop foundation. From all this, a conclusion has been proposed by Robin Law in his book on Oyo history, that Oyoila was not founded by a prince from Ife at all, but that the Ornmian tradition was a creation aimed at conferring Yoruba legitimacy on the rulers of Oyoila. Lore writes that of the traditions of Bariba, Noop and Oranmi and foundation of Oyoila. Skepticism seems most justified with regard to the one that connects the Oyo royal dynasty with Ila Ife. Given the strong prejudice among the Yoruba that only descendants of Odudua could validly claim royal status, a tradition of origin from Ila Ife might readily have been fabricated in order to create a spurious legitimacy for the rulers of Oyo. Against these suggestions, however, the following picture needs to be considered. The demographic nature of the area where Oyoila was founded was, as earlier pointed out, frontier country where, according to Aribid S. E. Usman, supported by Yoruba, Noop and Bariba traditions, Bariba, Noop and Yoruba settlers and settlements were already closely interspersed by at least the 11th century. Further and further southwards from the frontier area, Oyo Yoruba settlements increasingly predominated. Now, Oyo traditions are unambiguous that Ornmian went all the way north to the frontier area where Oyo. Bariba and Noop settlements lived closely side by side. The obvious probability then is that the town which he created combined some early Oyo, Bariba and Noop settlements. Indeed, that this is more than mere probability is attested to by the well-known fact that Oyoila, as it grew, contained many Bariba and Noop families, ancient, pre ornmian families in the area, subjects of the Alafin, who played significant roles in Oyo Al's history its society, religious and political life, its military, and its cultural and artistic growth. From this strong probability, 
Other probabilities flow as follows, at first, the inhabitants of the old settlements received Ornmi and peacefully and therefore the Bariba chief who is said to have helped him to find a location to settle and the Noop chief whose daughter he married would be chiefs of the early settlements who welcomed him peacefully when he came. But, over time, the existence of his Oyoila kingdom in this frontier area attracted more and more of Oyo settlers, until the point was reached that the Oyo population seemed to be on the way to taking over the whole frontier area and swallowing up the Bariba and Noop population. To this growing threat, the Bariba and Noop elements ultimately reacted with violence, confronting the young town of Oyoila with some troubles internally and then Bariba and Noop attacks from the surrounding country. Memories of the pre ornmian settlements and chiefs would survive, resulting in lingering traditions of Bariba and Noop foundation and dynasties. Such a historical development as this harmonizes more or less perfectly with the scenario described by Aribidesi Usman for all the frontier area south of the river Niger in about the 11th to the 13th century. It makes many details in the Ornmian tradition more obviously meaningful the initial brief period of peace in the New Kingdom, the subsequent violence and need to evacuate to Oko, Sango's return of the kingdom from Oko to the original location, and the persistence of Bariba and Noop hostility. It accounts for all the surviving traces of traditions of Bariba and Noop dynasties in the foundation of Oyoila, while upholding the Ornmian tradition. With regard to Sango, the picture would be that though his mother was Noop, he was raised as a prince of the Yoruba by a Yoruba father and king and that his loyalties were firmly Yoruba. After Sango's death, Ajaka was again made king. During his second reign, Ajaka sat on a much safer throne and ruled over a militarily stronger kingdom all the fruits of Sango's achievements. Not much is said in the traditions about this reign other than that Ajaka fought a number of successful engagements against the Noob. Not much detailed information, likewise, is available about the next few reigns, covering probably near 200 years. Ajaka was succeeded by his son, Aganju. According to traditions recorded by Samuel Johnson, when Aganju died, his son Kori was too young to be made king, so one of his wives named Ia Yun served as regent for a few years. Kori was a youth when he was crowned Alafin, and he ruled for many years. Kori was succeeded by Aluwaso. One other Alafin of this early period, Aluudo, is usually excluded from the list of Alafins because, according to some traditions, he drowned in the Niger in the course of a war against the Noop. Apparently, he drowned soon after he was crowned Alafin and the chiefs did not have his body for the royal funeral rituals, as a result of which the palace traditions treated him as if he never reigned. During this early period when these kings ruled in Oyoila, it was only a small kingdom no more than one of the small towns in the northern parts of the Oyo country. The fact that Oranmian had to go all the way to the northwestern extremities of Oyo territory before he could stop to establish his kingdom points to the strong probability that other towns had prior claims to the territory. One such town would be Ogboro. Another would be Ou. Ou might still be in the area near Ogboro, or, if it had relocated further south, might still be known to have interests in the area. Yet another would be Adikun. In this regard, local traditions concerning the early relationship of Oyoila with some of these towns are very important. Some of these traditions have it that the king of Oyoila did not originally have a crown and that he later seized the one belonging to the Al Adikun of Adikun. Such stories of seized crowns are common all over Yoruba land. Usually they mean that a town that was originally regarded as a leading town in an area was later superseded by another. Adikun was some 45 miles to the southwest of Oyoila, it may have been bigger and more important than Oyoila in early times. Some Ogboro traditions also claim that the first Anasambo of Ogboro, some 50 miles west of Oyoila, was a senior brother of Ornmian. Again, in the codes of Yoruba political language, to say that a ruler was a senior brother of another was to say that he was superior to him in some way. The kind of superiority that the early rulers of Ogboro had over the early rulers of Oyoila is now not clear. Ogboro was probably a considerably bigger town than Oyoila in early times. In these early times, Oyoila began its journey to political and territorial greatness by establishing, first, some superiority and dominance over the Oyo towns nearby. Compelled to learn the art of war in order to survive the Bariba and Noop attacks of its early years, Oyoila had managed to free itself from paying tributes to Ou, and then had kept the Bariba and Noop at bay. While continuing the clashes with the Bariba in the northwest and the Noop in the northeast, Oyoila began also to use its growing military muscle to acquire dominance over other Oyo towns to its west, south and east. According to the traditions of Ogboro to the west, Oyoila made war on Ogboro during the reign of the Alafin Aganju. In these wars, some of the towns in the area, Igbana, Emeri, Tede and others, came to the aid of Ogboro. Ogboro lost or was worn down over time, 
so that it accepted the leadership of the Alafan over the area. Oyo Il also most probably fought Adi Kun to the southwest. In short, Oyo Ila was doing in the country of the Oyo subgroup what the Ilesa kingdom was doing in the country of the Ijesa. However, Oyo Ila came off more successful than Ilesa. While the Oa of Ilesa never became anything more than the senior brother among the kings of Ijesa, the Ilafan gradually became the great king of all the Oyo, much like the Olau among the Oo subgroup. This position was achieved, most certainly, only slowly over a long time, but was probably completed by the 16th century. While making this progress in the Oyo country, Oyo Ila continued to fight the Bariba and Noop. The traditions indicate clearly that, after some time, it ceased being merely a defender and took the war into the country of the Noop. In fact, Oyo Ila forces seem to have crossed the Niger and taken the war into the heartlands of the Noop, as the tradition of the drowning of one Alafan in the Niger during one war against the Noop would seem to suggest. Fall and Revival of Oyo Ila In the early 16th century, however, Disaster befell the Oyo Ila kingdom. The Noop, who had been divided into many small chiefdoms throughout all their early history, became unified about this time into one kingdom under Adijai, also known as Tsodan Noop traditions. Noop armies entered into Igbamana and northern Ijesa and Akiti. A strong Noop army invaded the Oyo country, overcame the defenses of Oyo Ila, and overran Oyo Ila city itself. The reigning Alafin was Onigbogi, successor to Ayuwaso. Oyo Ila was sacked and its inhabitants fled in all directions. Onigbogi fled northwestwards into the Bariba country where, fortunately, one Bariba chief offered him hospitality. The Oyoila kingdom ceased to exist, only the Ilafan Onigbogi and the few chiefs and attendants around him remained as testimony to its existence. But this terrible disaster was to prove only a brief interlude in the history of Oyoila. The kingdom rallied and then marched forward more decisively than ever before. Its greatest days were about to dawn. According to Oyo traditions recorded by Samuel Johnson, Onigbogi had a Bariba wife, the daughter of the leading chief of one of the Bariba groups. It was this woman's father who gave him hospitality. He was allowed to settle with his followers in a small town which Yoruba people called Gber probably Gberigburu, some 60 miles northwest of the deserted city of Oyoila. Onigbogi died at Gber and was succeeded as Alafin by Ofenron, his son by the Bariba wife. Joining, or joined by, some Bariba. Ofenron participated in raids into the Oyo country. One such raid resulted in the destruction of the Oyo town of Arawo. Thereafter, a clash of interests developed between the Ilafin and his Bariba hosts and resulted in disagreement between them. Ofenron therefore left the Bariba country and returned southeast into Yoruba land, where he took up residence in the Oyo town of Kusu, about 50 miles west of Oyoila. Ofenron died at Kusu and was succeeded by Agunoju who moved his throne first briefly to Shaki and then to Igboho about 40 miles from Oyoila. Igboho was founded by the Ilafan Igunoju as a new capital for the kingdom. Igunoju and three successors, Orampoto, Ajiboid and Abipa, ruled at the new capital before, at last, Abipa moved the throne back to Oyoila. It was at Igboho that the Ilafan's government established solid measures for returning home to the city of Oyoila. Apparently, Learning the lesson of their disastrous military failure against the Noop, the Oyo government took steps to set up a powerful cavalry force. Cavalry had been a feature of Oyo Isle's armies since the time of Sango, but at Igboho it became the core of its military strength. Another major military development at Igboho was the upgrading of the ESO, described by some historians as the Alafan's Praetorian Guard, and by others as the Alafan's Imperial Guard or Noble Guard. The town of Ikoi was founded by the Alafans at this time, and it became the center where the bulk of this elite force was trained and stationed. Ikoi thereafter grew to become the greatest military center of the kingdom, outside the city of Oyoila. From this account about Ikoi as well as Kusu and Igboho, it is certain that the Oyoila authorities in exile began a major incorporation of the human and material resources of the rest of the Oyo country into the efforts to rebuild their kingdom. The unrelenting threats by the Noop and Bariba facilitated the willing cooperation of other Oyo kingdoms. The ultimate outcome of this development was the emergence of a consolidated Oyo kingdom under the leadership of the Alafan. It is important that the nature of this consolidated Oyo kingdom be understood. The various kings of the Oyo country did not become subordinate bales in a kingdom of Oyoila, they continued to be kings over their kingdoms. But they were kings who willingly pooled all the assets and resources of their kingdoms and allowed the Alafan's government to direct the use of it all, for the common good. Some measures of a cultural nature believed to have potential for strengthening the kingdom, were also adopted in exile. One was the elevation of the Ifa cult to a state cult. 
Oyo traditions have it that the Alafan Onigbogi's mother, Eregba, a native of Ida in Awari, had suggested just such a step in the good days of Oyoila, but that the authorities had ignored her suggestion. After the kingdom collapsed under Onigbogi, the belief spread that it was because the gods were angry with Oyoila on account of its disregard for Ifa, the god of divination. At Kusu, therefore, Ofenran officially had rituals and observances set up giving a new prominence to the Ifa cult in the affairs of the kingdom. The cult of Igungun was elevated in the same way. Igungun was common to all Nup and Yoruba, but Oyoila had never recognized its power as a state cult. On the other hand, the Nup had much regard for Igungun, and harnessed its spiritual support for war by sending Igungun mask bearers with their armies. At Igboho, the Alafans government made the Igungun cult a state cult and, from then on, Igungun mask bearers became constant companions of Oyoila armies. Not surprisingly, as soon as the exiled Oyoila government appeared in the Oyo country again, its old enemies, the Bariba and Noop, rose to the attack. In the reign of Orampoto at Igboho, a strong Bariba raiding group came to attack Igboho. Orampoto's army met them at Eli and crushed them. Not long after, in the reign of Aja Boyd, Orampoto's successor, the Noop came with a large army and penetrated to Igboho itself. In a fierce and close-fought battle outside Igboho, the Noop army was put to flight and its commander, a chief named Lyomo, was taken captive. These two decisive victories, then, served notice on Oyoal's enemies that it had come back to life, and that the balance of military strength had shifted. Without any serious enemy left to oppose him, the Alafan Abipa decided to take the government of his kingdom back home to its own city of Oyoila. In the last days at Igboho, some of the high chiefs, reluctant to abandon their compounds or to leave their unharvested farms behind, tried a trick to frustrate or delay the departure. Knowing that the Alafan was sending a party of men to reconnoiter the site of the old city, they sent in advance some persons whom Yoruba people call any or Isa, people of the gods, the Basaran sent a hunchback, the Asipel leper, the Alapinian albino, the Shamu a man with a deformed jaw, and the Akinaku a cripple. When the royal survey party came to the site of the old palace, these strange persons, carrying torches in the nearby woods, roamed around all night screaming Kose, Kose, no room. No room. Frightened, the royal messengers went back to report to the Alafan. But the Alafan quickly found out what was happening and sent some hunters to go and round up the fake phantoms. From this episode, the Alafan Abipa was given the cognomen Abamoro the king who caught ghosts, a cognomen still applied to the Alafans. The story of the Alafans catching of the fake ghosts is still reenacted at Oyo on certain festivals and at the time of the installation of Alafans. After departing from Igboho, the Alafan stopped for a short time at a place called Cog Bay to allow certain repairs on the palace to be completed. From Cog Bay, Abipa and his chiefs made the final triumphal journey to Oyoila see Chapter 8. The return of the Alafan to Oyoila was a great event. Many days of ceremonies followed, during which sacrifices were offered in the palace and in many places in the city. From all over Yoruba land, kings sent fraternal messages to the Alafan. According to the traditions, only the Oavilesa did not send any and, for a long time, the leaders of Oyoila held it against the Ilesa kingdom. Igboho was to remain from then on an imperial city a sort of second capital city, ruled by a representative chosen by the Ilafan. It has survived till the present, and its ruler continues to be appointed in the same old way. Also, the graves of the Ilafans who were buried there can still be seen, all marked by large earthen ramparts tended by an important official. Growth and Power the reign of the Alafan Abipa who brought the government back to Oyoila has been dated to about the last quarter of the 16th century about 157,090. Back in Oyoila, the government settled down remarkably quickly the monarchy, the palace organization, the chieftaincy system, and all other institutions. The explanation for such an accomplishment must be that all arms of the government had remained functional during the years of exile, especially in the years spent at Igboho. Moreover, while the Alafans had moved gradually towards home, Many important families seem to have also taken steps to return from the places to which they had been scattered. The years following the return of the Alafan to Oyoila proved to be years of phenomenal achievements by the kingdom. From being a small kingdom, it expanded rapidly to become an empire, so that the Alafan became an emperor whose territories included Yoruba kingdoms and non-Yoruba peoples. At the peak of the greatness of the Oyo Empire in about the middle of the 18th century, its main components were as follows, first. The country of the Oyo subgroup became what may be described as the metropolitan province of the empire. The Alafan ceased being merely the king of Oyoila and became the king of a consolidated kingdom of all the Oyo people, with Oyoila as his capital city. 
of the other Yoruba included in the empire, the Igbado were in many respects close to the Oyo, the Ilafin became effectively the king of all the Igbado. In the other Yoruba provinces of the empire Oo, Igba, Igbamana, some far western kingdoms in Idissa and others the kingdoms accepted the Ilafin as their overlord and protector, and paid regular tribute to him. Then, there were the non-Yoruba provinces, made up of some part of the country of the Noop on the southern banks of the Middle Niger, much of the Bariba country all the way west of the river Moshi, and the country of the Asia all the way southwest to include their coastal towns and west to their boundaries with the Uinakan. The expansion of the Alafin's authority over all these territories was accomplished at a fast pace. The chronological growth of the expansion is difficult to trace, but it is well known that its ways and means differed from province to province. In the country of the Oyo subgroup, apart from the early conflicts between Oyoila and other Oyo towns, like Adikun and Ogboro, the establishment of the Alafin as king of all Oyo people was not accomplished with the force of arms. From quite early in the history of the Oyoila kingdom, its commercial weight, derived from its advantageous location on the north-south routes across the Niger and east-west routes in the country south of the Niger, had gradually made it the economic heart of the Oyo homeland. This had, no doubt, gradually boosted Oyo Isle's political stature. At the same time, the growth of its military muscle, consequent on its responses to Bariba and Nuke pressures, had gradually made Oyo Isle the strong kingdom in the Oyo country, and its foremost defender against the Nuke from the northeast and the Bariba from the northwest. From the south also, the ambitious Igesa kingdom of Ilesa seems to have early constituted a threat to Oyo settlers on and near the banks of the Asan River. In the reign of the Ilafin Kori, Oyo Ila authorities established the town of Eid on the Asan to defend this area, a clear indication that Oyo Ila early began to see itself as a defender of the Oyo country. By the time of the Noop sack of Oyo Ila, the security needs and the political destiny of the Oyo Ila kingdom and of the rest of the Oyo homeland had become closely knit together. With the Oyo Ila government away in exile at Burr, the Oyo country was wide open to Noop and Bariba raids. The Ilafin Nofan Ron, as would be remembered, collaborated with his immediate Bariba hosts in raids into the Oyo country, but his interests were different from theirs. While they were merely carrying on their tradition of raids into Oyo territory, his purpose was to confront and frustrate the Noop there. This, no doubt, was why, after the Bariba had destroyed the Oyo town of Irawo, he broke with them and returned into Oyo territory. From then on, the Ilafans, in their struggle to resuscitate their kingdom, had at their ready disposal the human and material resources of the whole of the Oyo country. The founding of Ikoi by the Ilafans, their development of Ikoi into a great military center, and the incorporation of the rulers and populations of all significant Oyo towns into one military system, followed. All these developments made possible the creation of the powerful army that crushed the Bariba and Noop invaders. The great armies that went out from then on to conquer an empire for the Ilafans were all mass armies of the consolidated kingdom of the Oyo people. As the empire grew to cover many lands, the supply of man for the Ilafans' armies was augmented from time to time from populations of Yoruba kingdoms outside the Oyo country, the Igbamana, Ibolo, Ou, Igba, Ibarapa and Igbato kingdoms, but the masses of Oyo men remained the large heart of the Ilafans' armies. Abitpa's successor, Abolo Kun who began to reign probably in 1590, is credited with initiating a deliberate policy of territorial expansion. After him, for nearly 200 years, until about 1780, there followed a long list of kings under whom, in general, more and more territories were added to the empire Jogbo, Odorawu, Kanran, Jain, Aibi, Azaniago, Ojigi, Buru, Amuniweye, Onizal, Samuel Johnson to whom we are indebted for the fullest and earliest recording of Oyo traditions relating to these kings, has tended to give considerable emphasis to the remembered moral lapses and weaknesses in their personal characters. In spite of the personal weaknesses of many of the Ilafans of this long period, however, the Oyo Empire continually grew both territorially and in economic prosperity. The tradition of military excellence was sustained and the army remained strong. Oyo armies became much better than their rivals, the Bariba and Noop, in the use of the cavalry. Horsemanship and marksmanship, with bow and arrow, became the passion and favorite sport of Oyo youths, skills at which they trained and competed tirelessly. On a second visit to Oyo Ila in 1826, after a journey through Bariba, Hausa and Noop countries, Richard Lander commented that Oyo people have the reputation of being the best bowmen in Africa, and the young men soon become excellent marksmen by frequent practice and steady perseverance. They amused themselves daily by attempting to discharge arrows through a small hole made for the purpose in a wall, at a great distance from the standing ground, and I have frequently seen individuals accomplish this difficult task three successive times, 
from a distance of up to 100 yards. It requires great and unceasing practice to attain to so much perfection. Yoruba people usually fought their wars during dry seasons when heavy downpours were rare, the roads were unlikely to get muddy, the rivers and streams were low or dry, and farm work was light. In Imperial Oyoila, the military campaigns of each dry season were opened with a grand ceremony in the palace, the highlight of which was that the war chiefs would kneel before the throne and ask the Alafin, who are your enemies? The Alafin's answer, derived, no doubt, from decisions earlier arrived at in high councils of government, constituted the army's marching orders for the season. Most of the greatest warriors of Yoruba history were produced by, and served, the Oyo Empire in its era of growth. Iba Magaji served both Obolokun and Ajagbo as Basarun, and commanded the earliest campaigns that conquered most of the Nup and Bariba countries. Kokoro Gongan, the first person to bear the title of Arona Kakanfo, see below, established the tradition of valor and ferocity in battle for all future holders of that title. He and his contemporary, the Basarana Kindine, were the heroes of the earliest campaigns in the Igbado country. The Basaran under the Alafa Nojigi, the personage known to history by the nickname Yao Yamba, is reputed to have been one of the greatest generals in the history of the Oyo Empire. After a long string of victories in wars, he succumbed to a freak accident on a campaign to Afa in the Ibolo country. Below the level of these topmost warriors, the empire was regularly blessed with a large number of brilliant commanders and soldiers who made the name of the Alafan feared over a large part of West Africa. The most distinguished of these were appointed as the ESO, the 70 titled military officers who commanded the armies in battle and reported directly to the Alafan through the Oyo Masi, the highest council of state. An awesome reputation and ethos of bravery and honor attached to the title of ESO. According to Samuel Johnson, each ESO wears an akoro, or coronet, and carries in his hand no weapon, but a baton or staff of war known as the Invincible. Many popular sayings pertain to the ESO. One has it that. One of two things befits an ESO, an ESO must fight and conquer, or, an ESO must fight and perish. Another says, an ESO must never be shot in the back, his wounds must always be right in front. In the early 17th century, the Alafa Najagbu created the title of Arona Kakanfo, the highest ESO of all the ESOs. The creation of such a title was a very important sign of the time a time of boundless territorial ambitions and tremendous military pride in the center of the Oyo Empire. The Kakanfo commanded specially selected elite forces and operated as a sort of field marshal. The Kakanfo was supposed to be the fiercest warrior in the land. At his investiture, the holder of this title shaved his head completely and 201 incisions are made on his occupant with 201 different lancets, and specially prepared ingredients from 201 vials are rubbed into the cuts, one for each. This is supposed to render him fearless. Thereafter, the Kakanfo, while shaving his head, must leave the lacerated part unshaved as a result of which the hair there would grow and be plaited into a tuft or pigtail, giving him a fearsome appearance. The Kakanfo was supposed to be continually engaged in battles, the longest he could stay without fighting was two years. Because he was supposed to yield place to nobody, the Kakanfo was not allowed to live in the capital city. As a result, Kakanfos always lived in provincial towns and villages. All told, the Kakanfo was a strange creation the creature of a kingdom that envisioned itself as perpetually at war. The negative potentialities of it ought to have been obvious to the leaders of the Oyo Empire, but in the euphoria of almost invariably successful wars of conquest, they were not. While the wars and the conquests lasted, the Kakanfo was an intoxicating, invaluable, instrument of state policy. Another creation of the time was the practice of sending multiple armies out at the same time, with the purpose of impelling them to outperform one another. This practice was begun under the Alafa Najagbo who made it a habit to send out four armies to different directions each time, one commanded by the Basarun, another by the Agba Akin, a third by the Kakonfo, and a fourth by the Asipa. Continued after him, it was a major contributor to the near invincibility of Oyo armies in battle. Territorial Expansion The homelands of the small neighbors of the Oyo, namely the Ibarapa to the west and the Imbolo to the east were the earliest non-Oyo territories to be incorporated into the Alafans' expanding kingdom, almost certainly during the reign of Obolokun, Ajagbo's successor, in the last years of the 16th century and the first years of the 17th. During the same reign also, the Alafans' armies followed the Nup into the Igbamana country, pushed them out of there, and then overran most of the western parts of the Nup territory on the southern banks of the Niger. The northern and western Igbamana kingdoms, with the exception of the Orangans' kingdom of Ila, became subjects of the Alafin, paying tribute to him, and contributing men and materials to his armies whenever so requested. 
Some Igbomina chiefs even commanded some of the Alafans' armies. The Igbomina kingdoms which thus came into the Oyo Empire enjoyed regular protection by the Alafans' armies against Noop incursions. The town of Igbaja was established as a fortified post for such defense purposes. As for the Noop people in the areas conquered by the Oyo armies, they too began to pay tribute to the Alafan. As far as is known, however, they were not required to supply men for his armies. The eastern parts of the Noop country south of the Niger, where the Oyo armies did not conquer, remained a source of incursions into Igbomina, but, on the whole, the power of the Oyo empire kept them at bay for nearly two centuries. The kingdom of Ila never became part of the territories controlled by the Ilafan in the Igbomina country, but it too was considerably shielded from Noop incursions by the presence of the Ilafan's armies in most of Igbomina. The Ilafan also attempted to expand his authority towards the south. Giving the excuse that the Ilaza authorities had sent no goodwill message at the time of the Ilafan Abapa's return to Oyo Ila, the Ilafan's government ordered an invasion of the Ijesa country. A cavalry force entered into the Ijesa forests, but it was repulsed by the Iwa's army and lost many men in the process. In the direction of the northwest, a series of invasions of the Bariba country suppressed Bariba groups all the way to the banks of the Moshi River. Like the Noop, the conquered Bariba became subjects of the Ilafan, paying regular tribute to him. In the southwest, as Oyo armies came sweeping through the Igbato country, its kingdoms and towns embraced the Ilafans' overlordship. The Ilafans' control over Igbato came ultimately to be second only to his rule over the Oyo country itself and its detailed administration. As would be remembered from earlier chapters, Oyo created new towns in Igbato or gave new responsibilities to old towns. Some of these, as imperial towns, had their governments closely controlled by the Ilafan, the rulers of some were even appointed by the Ilafan and some of the latter had for rulers servants of the Ilafan appointed and sent directly from Oyo Ila. In the wake of the Oyo armies came large numbers of Oyo traders and migrants from the Oyo country, increasing the population of many Igbato towns and considerably modifying the demographic composition of the Igbato country. By the 18th century, Igbato had become profoundly transformed by the influence of Oyo, and its people were among the most loyal subjects of the Ilafan. The Igba and Ou kingdoms, neighbors of the Igbato to the east, also became tributaries of the Ilafan, with the obligation to support his armies with men and materials. According to Igba traditions recorded by Biobaku, among the Igba, as among the Igbato, no military resistance was offered to the Ilafan's armies. By and large, the Igba were glad to be protected by his great power, and the Oo rulers were proud to be seen as his friends in south-central Yoruba land. As it developed then, most of the territorial expansion of the Oyo Empire was towards the southwest. This has led to suggestions that the rulers of Oyo were simply pursuing a policy aimed at establishing trade with Europeans along the coast. While the territorial expansion did boost Oyo's trade enormously, trade per se does not seem to have been the objective. The central objective was to expand the Ilafin's imperial control in all directions. The southwest, where open grasslands penetrated all the way to quite close to the coast, proved easier for the Oyo cavalry than other directions. Thoughts of expanding in other directions were never given up, however, the experiences of the Oyo cavalry in places like the Ijesa country made invasions of thickly forested territories highly unattractive. With regard to seeking trade relations with Europeans on the coast, indeed, the Oyo Ila authorities would seem to have had some reluctance, arising from their experience in the reign of Obolokun. According to Oyo Ila traditions, Obolokun received friendly messages from a European monarch and, to reciprocate, sent a large party of men, numbering 800, to take his goodwill message to the coast but none of the men was ever heard of again. This made the Oyo Ila Palace very suspicious of all Europeans for a long time. It is in this regard significant that the Oyo Ila authorities never attempted to equip their armies with guns from the coast, even though they could very easily have done so. Oyo's expansion into the country of the Asia people followed naturally upon the expansion into Igbato. Even when Oyo Ila had been only a small kingdom, it had done considerable trade with the Asia country through Igbato and the Kedu kingdom. By the time of the warrior king Ilafin Ajagbo, that is, about the middle of the 17th century, the Igbato country and most probably the territories of the far western Yoruba kingdoms, with the notable exception of Ketu, even as far as the small Asia kingdom of Wem on the Popo coast, had come under the control of the Oyo Empire. That made Oyo controlled territories neighbors of the Alida kingdom, the oldest and most important of the Asia kingdoms. Moreover, the founding of the Dahomey kingdom, another Asia kingdom, some distance to the north of Alida in about 1625, and Dahomey's general aggressiveness, as it grew stronger, against all its neighbors, 
was destined to threaten the oldest routes carrying Oyo's trade through the area as well as parts of territories that Oyo considered to be Oyo-controlled land. As a result, Dahomey was to become an important military objective in Oyo-Ila. Statements by some European coastal traders that an Oyo invasion of the Asia country took place between 1680 and 1682 are now regarded as doubtful. But a major Oyo invasion did occur in the 1690s. Some political trouble developed in the Kingdom of Alida, and an aggrieved group of Alida citizens sent a delegation to Oyo Ila in 1698 to urge the Ilafin to intervene. In response, the Ilafin sent an envoy to advise the King of Alida to put his house in order. In blatant contravention of well known Yoruban Asia laws, which protected envoys from even the faintest molestation, the Asia king seized and killed the Oyo envoy. Oyo armies therefore marched out. According to Oyo traditions, the offending king fled and vanished, and the Oyo commander, on return to Oyo Ila, was disgraced for not bringing him captive. The Alida kingdom was viciously ravaged and large numbers of its people were taken captive. The available evidence shows that the Alida kingdom never truly survived this disaster. In the years that followed, its power and influence sank lower and lower. Since Alida had been regarded by all the Asia as their foremost kingdom, its decline altered the pattern of relationships among Asia kingdoms. Wida, a port town of the Kingdom of Savi, developed to become a major slave port on the West African coast, and the Savi kingdom itself became better known by the name Wida. Thanks also to perpetual meddling by European slave traders in the internal affairs of both Wida and Alida, as well as in their relationships with each other, both suffered endless internal dissensions and ultimately went to war with each other, a development that weakened Alida the more and weakened Wida also. The younger kingdom of Dahomey, located farther in the interior, saw the situation closer to the coast as an opportunity for its own commercial and territorial expansion. In 1724, Dahomey invaded, conquered and occupied Alida, and three years later prepared to do the same to Wida. Agaja, the king of Dahomey, was about to become ruler over a kingdom stretching from the Abomey Plateau to the coast. The Oyo authorities were not prepared to accept the developments in the Asia country. Following Oyo's conquest of Alida in 1698, the Ilafin had regarded it as part of his empire. In late 1726, therefore, a large Oyo army headed for war with Dahomey. The Dahomey army was armed with guns, and Agaja was confident that it would overcome the Oyo cavalry. He was mistaken. The ensuing battle was sharp and short. A huge number of Dahomey soldiers fell, and the rest scattered. Agaja himself first fled into a swampy thicket to hide, and then came out and surrendered, agreeing to pay heavy tribute to the Alafin. Believing, like all observers, that Dahomey was finished militarily, the Oyo army returned home. But Agaja soon proved that he was far from finished. In 1727, he overran Wida. Then, when he heard that a very large Oyo army, commanded by the great warrior Yayaba, was coming towards Dahomey, he evacuated and burned his capital city of Abomey made his subjects abandon their villages and flee into forest areas where the Oyo cavalry could not reach them, and he himself took refuge in a forest. The Oyo army came and found the country empty no towns, villages, houses, farms, food. Consequently, they quickly returned to their own country, and as soon as they left, the Dahomeans returned and rebuilt their homes. Yao Yamba and his officers became resolved to crush this troublesome little kingdom. Early in 1729, they were back again on the road to Dahomey. Once again, Agaja played the only card available to him. After burying his palace treasures, he burned Abomey again and instructed his subjects to burn everything and flee into the forests. This time around, the Oyo army would not go away quickly or easily. Special units were sent to pursue the Dahomeans into many of their hideouts, capturing many and killing more. While these operations went on, the main Oyo army dug its feet deep into the country and refused to go away. The dry season passed and the rainy season began but the Oyo army did not leave. In the Dahomeyan hideouts, the hidden supplies of food began to run out, with consequent starvation and deaths. By the time the Oyo army finally left, Agaja and his people had suffered tremendously. But, as they were settling down and putting the shattered pieces of their lives together again, news came that yet another Oyo army was coming. The Oyo authorities had apparently decided that the way to beat Agaja and his people was to wear them down. Agaja sued for peace requesting the director of the Portuguese fort at Wida to arrange things between him and the representatives of the Ilafans government. In the peace treaty that resulted in 1730, Dahomey accepted the overlordship of the Ilafan and agreed to pay him annual tribute. Oyo accepted the reconstitution of the Dahomey kingdom to include former Dahomey, Wida and a part of Alida, that is, virtually all of the Asia country, with its capital moved from Abomey and the interior to Alida near the coast. 
The remaining part of Alida, with a strong Yoruba component, was constituted into a separate small kingdom with the name of Ajis, called Porto Novo by the Europeans. Dahomey sent a young prince named Dogbesuk to live in the Alafin's palace as a pledge that it would faithfully carry out the terms of the treaty. Also, the Alafin gave a daughter in marriage to the king of Dahomey, and received a Dahomey princess in marriage. The expanded kingdom of Dahomey, made up of almost all the Asia country, thus became a province of the Oyo Empire. From about the early 1740s, however, strains again appeared in Oyo's relationship with Dahomey, largely because Dahomey could not pay the tribute regularly. Some minor Oyo invasions occurred in 1742 and 1743, and thereafter it looked again and again as if a major Oyo invasion would follow. In 1748, therefore, Togbesu, by then king of Dahomey, entered into another treaty with Oyo, reaffirming the 1730 treaty. He also obtained Oyo's permission to return the capital of Dahomey to the town of Abomey in the interior. Thereafter, until the end of the 18th century, Dahomey remained a peaceful province of the Oyo Empire. The Alafans also had thoughts and plans of expanding their empire to the south and east. In the reign of the Alafan Ojigi, an army was sent to the Ibolo country. The details of this campaign are obscured in the Oyo traditions by the account of the accident that caused the death of its illustrious commander, the Basaran Yao Yamba. Oyo traditions say that the army was going towards Afa when Yao Yamba sustained the fatal accident. That does not help us to answer the question whether the campaign was against Afa or whether its objective was the territories beyond Afa and the Imbolo country the territories of the Okan Yoruba and the Akiti. As would be remembered, by as early as the reign of Ajagbo in the late 16th century, the Imbolo country, of which Afa was the leading town, had become part of the Oyo Empire. As early as the early 17th century, Oyo-controlled territory had extended to the Igbomina country immediately north of Otun in northern Akiti, where a Benin army had, in that century, encountered Oyo's frontier troops. It seems fairly certain, then, that Yao Yamba's army was sent to use Afa as base for a campaign for new territorial acquisitions in the territories of the Okan Yoruba and probably also northern Akiti. The timing of the campaign would be some years after Yao Yamba's monumental campaigns against Dahomey, probably in the 1730s. The sending of an officer of Yao Yamba's stature is a strong indication that the Alafans government had major objectives for this campaign. Unfortunately, the campaign ended in a disaster. According to Oyo traditions, just before Afa, Yao Yamba fell with his horse into a deep ditch, broke his neck, and died and, as a result, the campaign was called off. The reign of Ojigi represented the high-water mark of the territorial expansion of the Oyo Empire. The whole expanse of the Oyo Yoruba country constituted its metropolitan province. To the northeast, in the Noop country, it controlled a large slice of Noop territory, up to the southern banks of the river Niger. Northwestwards, it included Bariba territory up to the banks of the Moshi River. Eastwards, it included most of Igbomina and all of the Ibolo country to a boundary with the northern Ekiti. Southwards, it shared a long boundary with the Ijesa and Ife, with it on the Asin River as a frontier post, and then it dipped down to include the Ou, Igba and Igbato territories, as well as a slice of Awari territory on the Atlantic coast and, from the 1770s, the kingdoms of Badagri and Ajis, Porto Novo. Westwards, it included the far western Yoruba countries of Saabe, Ihori, and Idisa, and all the territory of the Asia people to beyond the river Mano east of the kingdom of Atakpaim. Late in his reign, probably in the early 1740s, the Alafa Nojigi sent an expedition to trace the outer boundaries of his empire. Johnson's rendering of the tradition concerning this expedition relates that Ojigi, in order to show his undisputed sovereignty over the whole of the Yoruba country, including Benin, sent out a large expedition which struck the Niger in the north, near the Ibaribas, and coasted along the right bank until they arrived at the coast and returned to Oyo by the Popo country. The claim that the Oyo Empire included Benin is certainly an exaggeration, but it did have its northern boundary on the river Niger and its southern boundary on the Atlantic Ocean. By the time of Ojigi, Oyo people seem to have been referring to the southwestern, or Asia and western Yoruba, territories in general as Popo country. The kingdom of Atakpame lay in Asia territory northeast of the area that Oyo armies and traders referred to as Popo country, in the territory west of the river Mano. Atakpame itself was probably never subject to Oyo. However, in 1764, an Oyo army stationed in the area of Atakpame clashed with, and defeated, an Ashanti army in the territory west of Atakpame probably in an area that is now Yoruba territory in the Republic of Togo. The Alafans had a great festival, a sort of jubilee called Bibi, with which they celebrated long or successful reigns. When the Alafan Nogbo Luye celebrated the Bibi in the 1760s, 
1060 vassal rulers, according to Oyo traditions, came to Oyo Ila to honor their suzerain. Administration of the Empire In essence, the Oyo Empire was a large Yoruba kingdom, ruled according to the typical Yoruba system of government applied over a vast territory. At the head of it all was the Ilafin, a typical Yoruba divine king. Like the kings of all Yoruba kingdoms, the Ilafin was selected from the pool of princes of one royal lineage. For the selection, all princes, sons and grandsons of former kings, were eligible with the singular exception of the oldest son of the recently deceased king. From the early 17th century, this one prince, with the title of Arimo, was allowed to be freely associated with his reigning father in matters of government, and then he had to die, by committing suicide, when his father died. Succession by primogeniture was, as would be remembered, generally rejected by Yoruba kingdoms, Oyo Isle's requirement that the Arima must die represents a particularly drastic rejection of it. The purpose, as in all Yoruba kingdoms, was to ensure that the right of the people to select their king would not be interfered with by one privileged prince. As in all Yoruba kingdoms, in theory, by popular sayings, and as demonstrated in civic ceremonies and rituals, the government was the Alafin's government, and he was supposed to have the power of life and death over his subjects. But, in reality, in the Yoruba system of limited monarchy over which he reigned, he was subject to well-established, powerful, institutions, as well as to elaborate rules and prohibitions. The High Inner Council of Chiefs, named the Oyo Masi, consisting of seven of the most powerful quarter chiefs of the capital city of Oyo Ila, the Basarun, Agbagan, Samu, Alapini, Laguna, Akiniku and Asipa, met with the Ilafin daily in the palace to make all laws and take the highest decisions of government. Such laws and decisions were then announced to the kingdom as the Ilafin's word. Outside that system, the Ilafin might not try to operate. In the generally militarized mode of existence to which this kingdom was forced by circumstances, the high chiefs of the Oyo Masi were also the highest military chiefs. They also bore the responsibility of selecting new kings, and of removing an unpopular king by asking him, if matters came to such an end, to go to sleep, see Chapter 8. The highest officer in the Oyo Masi was the Basarun who bore responsibilities akin to those of a prime minister or chancellor and presided over the Oyo Masi in council. Of the other members of the Oyo Masi, the Agbagan had charge of the worship of Ornmian in addition to other duties, the Laguna was the kingdom's highest ambassador, a sort of foreign minister, in the most critical situations, the Asipa was, in the council of the Oyo Masi, the Ojawa, he who distributed presents given to the Oyo Masi. The Alapini was the officer in charge of the Agungun mysteries and, over time, he became the head of all religious affairs. The lineage to which the Alapini title belonged was an old Nuke lineage. Below the level of the Oyo Masi existed many councils and committees of chiefs, each for a particular function of state, the individual members of which bore specific state responsibilities. In and around the palace, a large number of officers, high and low, ministered to the needs of the king, the king's personal family, the palace, and the palace shrines and rituals. This palace establishment grew to include hundreds of people. The highest rank of palace servants was that of the eunuchs who had charge of the personal affairs, and the wives and children, of the king. Usually, a eunuch was a very substantial royal official who had his own large compound where he served as guardian to the king's children and nursing wives. Absent in other Yoruba palaces, the institution of eunuch would seem to have been a borrowing from the cultures of the western Sudan beyond the Niger. Below the eunuch was a large number of Ilaras, male and female, who served as the king's messengers and personal servants. The most experienced of the Ilaras were sometimes sent as envoys to foreign governments or to special jobs in the provinces of the empire. Among the eunuchs and Ilaras, some performed purely religious functions in the palace. Far more than any other Yoruba kingdom, the political system of the Oyo Empire emphasized military strength and preparedness. Apart from the high military chiefs of the Oyo Masi, Almost every other chief, no matter what functions he performed in the state, was also supposed to be a military officer, able and ready to command troops. High military positions enjoyed enormous respect and honor in the society, and the upbringing of the youths of the Oyo homeland devoted much emphasis to military skills. Some cities close to Oyo Ila particularly focused on military training and preparedness. Among these were Koso, the town founded to the memory of Sango, Igbagun, Igboho, Iresa, Ogbomoso, Indeed, but the most important was Ikoyi. The Anakoyi, ruler of Ikoyi, was the greatest provincial military chieftain. Young men who emerged into adulthood with the best military distinctions anywhere in the Oyo country stood a chance of being appointed by the Alafin's government as military officers. 
Of such officers, the most honored were the ESO, 70 in number, about whom something has earlier been said. The Aronakakonfo was usually referred to as the ESO of the ESOs, and so he was in essence, but, usually he was not appointed from among the ESOs the position was usually given to a provincial ruler who had strong military credentials. The earliest Alafans personally led their armies to war. As would be remembered, one of the earliest Alafans, Aluudo, drowned in the river Niger while leading his army in a war with the Noop. A later Alafan, Aja Boyd, nearly lost his life in the battle with the Noop outside the walls of Egboho, during the exile. From the time of Abipa, Aja Boyd's successor, the Alafans no longer led their armies in person. That task fell to the great war chiefs. The above, then, is a brief summary of the central government of the Oyo Empire. Outside Oyoila, the rest of the Oyo country constituted the metropolitan homeland of the empire, its base and main support. This Oyo country was made up of many kingdoms, each with its capital city, where its king lived, and smaller towns and villages, where Bales lived. All these kings accepted the Alafan as the supreme king of all Oyo people, paid tribute to him, and held all the human and material resources of their kingdoms available and expendable in his service. It is important to repeat the fact that these kings were not Bales under the Alafan, they were kings, Aba, over their own kingdoms kings in a consolidated kingdom of all Oyo people, over which the Alafan was unanimously accepted as supreme king and commander-in-chief. The whole Oyo homeland was conceived as comprising three provinces called Ikunotan and Ikunosi, both belonging to the center, and the Epo province, in the far south. These three, plus the Ibolo country in the east, constituted what may be described as the metropolitan heart of the empire. The Ikunotan province comprised some Oyo towns and all the small Ibarapa country. In the Ikunosi, to the east of Oyoila, the main kingdoms were Ikoi under the Anakoyi, Igban under the Ilugban, Eresa under the Eresa, Ijeru under the Ampechu, Ogbamoso under the Sun. In the Ikunotan, to the west of Oyoila, the main kingdoms were the kingdoms of Agana under the Sabigana, Iwere under the Oniwere, Asia under the Elasia, Oko under the Anjo, Agaijan under the Bagaijan, Saki under the Okare, Ibode under the Alapata, Igboho under the Ono Onabode, Ipapo under the Elarinpo, Kisi under the Akisi, Isain under the Asain, Adu under the Alado, the Ibarapa kingdom of Aru under the Alarua, Uya under the Aluj. In the Ibolo province, the main kingdoms were Ikiran under the Akiran, Ilabu under the Ilobu, Ifeodan under the Adimula, Afa under the Alifa. In the Epo province, the kingdoms were few, Iwo under the Aliwo, Ides under the Andes and Ede under the Timi. By the late 18th century, Osogbo, originally a frontier Ijesa town, had become an important cosmopolitan center of trade, and had received so many Oyo settlers as to become predominantly Oyo. As a result, it was regarded generally as a kingdom in the Epo province of the Oyo Empire. Outside of these provinces of the metropolitan center, the common characteristic of Oyo's imperial administration of each subordinate kingdom was the stationing of an official representative of the Alafans government, with the title of Ajel, in every important town. The main duty of the Ajel was to collect the tributes and send them to Oyo Ila. However, Oyo traders and others away from home regarded the Ajel as the Oyo official at whose residence they could receive hospitality and protection. The Ajel also ensured that the local authorities maintained and protected the trade routes. As would be remembered, in a number of Igbato towns regarded by Oyo authorities as especially important for commercial or strategic reasons, the Alafans government established various kinds of nearly direct control. At the peak of the greatness of the Oyo Empire by about 1750, the Alafans government controlled an enormous treasury from the regular tributes, from the tolls on trade, and from, according to the Oyo traditions, a seemingly endless stream of gifts from all over the empire. The positioning of an Ajel in important towns of every vassal state to collect the tributes made their collection generally very efficient. For most vassal rulers, the annual delivery of the tributes was usually a festive occasion. No vassal ruler or Ajel wished for a situation in which the tributes were not rendered in full when due. In this regard, more information is available about Dahomey's experience than about any other vassal state of the Oyo Empire, because of Dahomey's close contact with literate European traders on the coast. From such information, it is known that the Dahomey economy, which came to depend heavily on the slave trade, declined considerably from about the 1740s. As a result, until the end of the century, there were some years when Dahomey could not come up with all its tributes when due. Whenever that happened, the Dahomey rulers incurred the intense displeasure of the Alafan. In fact, on some occasions, Dahomey found itself on the verge of being punished like a vassal state in full rebellion against the Alafan to the Dahomey rulers a very frightening predicament. It would seem, 
therefore, that the Alafans government did not tolerate any laxity in the payment of the tributes by the vassal states, after all, payment of the tributes was the most measurable proof of a vassal state's loyalty. Imperial revenues from tolls and dues on commerce, most certainly, also grew as the empire expanded. Trade was always a major factor in Oyo Isle's strength, and the empire, as it grew, became one sprawling trading state. To traders from all parts of the Oyo homeland, the empire was a vast land of opportunity. By the late 18th century, many prominent men in Oyo Ila were building wealth from trading, even most of the Alafans of the period were rich traders before they came to the throne, and some of them continued to own large trading establishments, using their wives as organizers of their business to distant parts of the empire, especially to the Igbado province, all the way to the coast at the ports of Badagri and Porto Novo. Oyo Ila, and the rest of the Oyo homeland, had some of the largest and busiest markets in the empire, of which Akazan, Oyo Isle's central marketplace, was the greatest. Apart from Akazan, Clapperton visited six other marketplaces in Oyo Ila, just as he had seen vibrant markets in every town along his route from Badagri to Oyo Ila. From all this great commercial activity, the Alafin derived much revenue on a regular basis from city gate tolls, marketplace dues, levies on particular articles of merchandise, and so forth. Moreover, gifts to the Alafin were a major source of imperial revenue gifts on special occasions and festivals from vassal rulers and chiefs, gifts from newly appointed kings and chiefs, gifts from funeral celebrations of prominent citizens, etc. In fact, in some vassal provinces, a given proportion of the movable wealth of prominent deceased chiefs was required as gifts to the Alafin. Again, the clearest information about this comes from Dahomey. Sometime in the 1780s, the then Mehu of Dahomey died and the Dahomey king. Agonglo, had a major part of his movable belongings and some of his wives sent to the Alafin Aobyodun. The Alafin was dissatisfied with the amount that was sent, and he expressed his displeasure so vehemently that Agonglo had to buy more items and some women slaves to send to the Alafin. Such acrimony over the sending of inheritance gifts to the Alafin would seem to have been uncommon, however. The families of most great men were proud to show off their late father's wealth by sending rich gifts to the Alafin. From about the second quarter of the 18th century, the slave trade became increasingly important in the economy of the Oyo Empire as well as in the revenue base of the Alafans government. Oyo gradually became the chief supplier of the slaves sold on the Yoruba coast, resulting in increased volumes of slave exports from the ports of Ajis, Porto Novo, Badagri and Lagos. The usual pattern of the trade was that the Oyo traders sold to coastal middlemen, like the Ijebu and Awari for the Lagos market and the Igbado and Awari for the Porto Novo market. The main sources of Oyo's slave supplies to the coast are known, however, the relative numerical importance of each source in the whole volume remains unclear. As would be remembered, Richard Lander recorded, during visits to Oyo Ila in 1826, that convicted criminals were a source of slaves sold to the coast by Oyo. Since convicts belonged to the state, this must have been a source of royal revenue exclusively. Very probably, from the time of the serious political troubles in Oyo Ila in the third quarter of the 18th century, in the time of the Basarun Goha, the number of ordinary persons convicted of offenses and sold into slavery increased significantly. Captives in war constituted a probably much larger source from the Oyo Wars in the Noop, Bariba and Asia countries. Oyo also bought large numbers of slaves from the Noop and Bariba, and from Houseland, mostly for resale on the coast, and partly also for sale to native buyers in the Oyo homeland who owned slaves for domestic and other types of labor. European slave traders on the coast were aware in the late 18th century that large numbers of the slaves being supplied to the coast were bought by the Oyo from the Noop country and from Houseland. Sultan Bello of Sokoto wrote that the Hausa country sold many slaves to the Yoruba. The slaves bought from the Noop comprised probably mostly Noop, and the rest comprised partly Yoruba, a Vigbamana, Okinoruba, a Koko and Nakiti origin, partly Kakanda, and partly Gabagi, northern neighbors of the Noop. Most of the Oyo trade in slaves belonged to private Oyo traders, but some part belonged to the royal establishment, bringing revenue to the palace. Tolls on the slave traffic also brought increasing royal revenue but never seems to have amounted to more than a small part of all tolls. Moreover, tributes from the vassal states regularly included some slaves, most of whom were usually absorbed into the royal service, the few who were sold yielded some revenue for the king's government. Finally, Criminal kidnapping contributed to the number of slaves reaching the coast through the Oyo traders. The number of the kidnapped was probably small at any time, but, understandably, popular fears and sentiment exaggerated it and have passed the exaggerations into the traditions. As for the provincial administration, it seems to have been completely self-supporting. 
The typical Ajel lived off the province where he was stationed, in fact, most Ayalis did well for themselves and became quite well-to-do dignitaries. Royal messengers traveling through the provinces also usually received rich gifts for their master and for themselves. As earlier pointed out, the provinces also supplied men to the Alafans' armies often forming contingents commanded by their own rulers. According to Igbamana traditions, one 17th-century king of Omapo in Igbamana, the Alamu Aparon, reputed to be a very gifted warrior, repeatedly commanded armies side by side with chiefs of the Oyo country, the Anakoyi, the Alugban and the Aresa, in the Alafans' wars. Archibald Dalzell, in his History of Dahomey published in 1793, talks of a 1784 campaign in which a strong Dahomey army, joined by troops from some western Yoruba kingdoms, and supported by Lagos, fought for the Alafan. Dalzell wrote, the operations of the Dahomey army were directed by the Io messengers. And nothing of importance was undertaken without their the Oyo messengers' concurrence. Two years later, the Dahomey army was again on the move for the Alafan against Wem. When they finished with Wem, they proposed to go on and attack Ardra and Porto Novo, but the Alafan did not approve, telling them that Ardra was Oyo's calabash out of which nobody should be permitted to eat but himself. In short, then, the Alafans' government was able to raise substantial armies at home and from the provinces for imperial objectives. We must not conclude from incidents in the revenue collection practices of the Alafans' government, however, that his overlordship in the provinces was habitually rough or brutal. It was not so for the most part. In fact, both at home and in the provinces, the government of the Alafans seems to have been, until the mid-18th century, mild and benevolent, and, towards the non-Yoruba subjects of the Alafan, the Oyo imperial government seems to have been remarkably open, generous and trusting. For instance, it was established imperial policy that the representative of the Alafan as ruler of Ayana, the Anasar of Ayana, in Igbato had to be an Oyo Ila palace servant who was of Nup origin, and many Nup and Bariba notables were regularly employed in important positions in the Oyo government and army. From about the middle of the 18th century, as will be seen in the next chapter, Oyo Ila experienced at home an increasing deterioration of the quality of leadership, and this manifested partly in increasing oppression of the common people even at home as well as in some harshness in dealings with the provinces. Before then, the government of the Oyo Empire attached much importance to order and respectability. The overall impression from the Oyo traditions is that, by and large, the functionaries of government maintained dignity and gravity in the performance of public duties, that this ethos rubbed off on the Alafans' officials and representatives in the provinces, that the average citizen of the empire was imbued with much pride, and that the citizens of even the most distant provinces felt comfortable about being protected by the power and authority of the imperial government of the Alafan. By the time that Clapperton and his team traversed part of the western provinces of the empire from Badagri to Oyoila in 18,256, standards of governance had fallen very seriously in the empire. The Alafans' government had become too preoccupied with its own troubles in and around Oyoila to exercise much control in the provinces. Yet, the foreigners still saw much orderly government, many respectable public officers, a country that respected the law and citizens who went about their daily affairs in peace and order. At Oyoila, at the end of his second visit to the city in 1826, Richard Lander commented that, but for the solitary exception of the compulsory suicide of the Arimo and a few other persons at the death of the Alafan, the people and rulers of the empire were mild in their manners and charitable in their dealings. The Oyo Empire, he said, is a fine kingdom, peopled with a mild, affectionate and unassuming race. We know today that all that so impressed him in 1826 were no more than residues of the high qualities of an earlier time when, before the mid-18th century, the government and the empire had been at their strongest and best. A country of great culture. The general peace prosperity and pride enjoyed during the middle period of the empire produced a very significant flowering of Yoruba civilization in the Oyo homeland. The ancient Yoruba arts of sculpture in various media, terracotta, wood and metals iron, copper, brass, bronze, silver, flourished in Oyoila and other Oyo cities and towns. Of course, the Alafans' palace represented the epitome of artistic decoration, with the palaces of the lower kings of the Oyo homeland coming close behind. The Alafans' palace had the tallest and proudest gables, called Gobi, in the land as well as the most gorgeous array of decorative sculptures together constituting a spectacle that attracted admirers from distant places in the empire. Some of the public shrines in Oyoila and other Oyo cities were also heavily decorated with sculptures, as well as with murals and other types of paintings. Richard Lander has given us a description of the principal shrine of Oyoila in 1826. This shrine, according to him, 
is the largest and most fancifully ornamented of any of a similar kind in the interior of Africa. It is a perfect square building, each side of which is at least 20 yards in length. Directly opposite the entrance is an immense figure of a giant bearing a lion on its head, carved in wood, and beautifully executed. About 26 or 27 figures, in base relief are placed on each of the sides of the hut, but all in a kneeling posture, with their faces turned towards the larger figure, to which they are apparently paying their devotions. On the heads of the small figures are wooden images of tigers, hyenas, snakes, crocodiles, etc., exquisitely carved and painted, or rather stained, with a variety of colors. Only the king and his high chiefs could enter onto the highly polished floors of this shrine for their daily devotions and rituals. Lower members of the society must do theirs outside the shrine. There were, according to Lander, fifty other shrines in Oyoila, all of them on a smaller and less magnificent scale than the main shrine described above but each beautifully decorated with sculptures and other works of art. Yoruba music attained some of its richest products in Imperial Oyo. Bata music, with its tight drums, almost metallic sounds, choppy, explosive rhythm, responded to with equally choppy and explosive dance movements, started in Oyo as sacred music to Sango, the god of thunder and lightning. But it became part of popular music and dance, even though its popular exponents usually dressed in ways reminiscent of the ritual clothing of Sango worship. Oyo was also the home of Gon Gon and Dun Dun the talking drums with their almost endless variations of music and rhythm for popular occasions, royal appearances, large family occasions, small band presentations with singing and dance, etc. From Oyo cities and towns, small and large troops and solo drummers went with all these types of music to other parts of Yoruba land. It was quite common for some of these troops to be away from home for years, weaving themselves into the local popular music culture of one town and then moving on to the next town. Also, from Oyo of the Imperial era we have decisive evidence of Yoruba entertainment that was theater or drama with stage, trained professional actors, plot, acts and scenes, costumes, properties, etc. Strong rudiments of theater and drama were a feature of many Yoruba rituals, especially reenactment features in sacred rituals, such as in the installation of kings. From such roots, there probably generally developed a tradition of distinctly popular, secular, theater and drama, but the only written description of it comes to us from Imperial Oyo. Clapperton and Lander were invited to one such theater production during their visit to Oyoila in January 1826. The theater stage was a large enclosure, near the palace, covered with lovely green grass, as level as a bowling green and rendered particularly pleasant by the refreshing shade afforded by clumps of tall trees. A lofty fan palm tree grew in the center of the place, under the branches of which the actors were accommodated, and a temporary fence erected around its trunk screened them from observation whenever they chose to be concealed. The main productions for that afternoon were pantomimes, the type of show usually held for kings visiting Oyoila. One vassal king was visiting that day and was in the audience. After a prelude of loud drums, horns and whistles, the first act began and consisted of dancing, capering, and tumbling by about twenty men enveloped in sacks, which novel and elegant divertissement was continued with admirable spirit for a full half hour. Lander remarked that in the art of tumbling, these dancers cannot be excelled by any people in the world, their revolutions in the air are perfectly astonishing, and by the suppleness and pliability of their limbs, by their bending and turning, and twisting themselves into all manner of shapes, one would be almost inclined to believe that they have not a single bone in their bodies. The second act, accomplished with very intricate costumes and masks, consisted of a fight on stage between a large snake, a boa constrictor, and a huge, whimsical, ugly monster armed with a sword. By using sax sewn in particular ways, and by very deft acting, two actors joined end to end to form the big snake on the stage. When they were done and the snake revealed itself, it looked very much like a natural boa constrictor, skin and all about 14 feet long. The sword-bearing monster had a headpiece so intricately made that he could change his expression and mood as often as he wished. With the sword, he tried to kill the snake, while the snake went after him, coiling and wriggling every way like a real snake, opening and shutting its jaws and darting out its forked tongue. All these evoked thunderous roars from the audience. Finally, after nearly half an hour of the fight, the monster managed to attack the snake from its tail, hacking at it furiously with the sword causing the snake to twist and writhe in agony at which point many masked actors sprang to the stage and carried the wounded snake away backstage. The third and last act consisted of the representation of the caricature of a white man by an actor with chalky white skin, mimicking the supposed walking and movements of a white man. This figure provoked the most uproarious laughter and applause of the afternoon, with the audience pointing in the direction of the two white men in their midst, 
and directing the white men to see their copy on the stage. Clapperton and Lander entered most cordially into the good humor of the moment. Each one of the first two acts was followed by an intermission of many minutes. And each intermission was filled with a concert of drums and whistles, accompanied by songs from a choir of female voices, generally joined in by the audience. A long concert of drums, whistles, horns, singing and dancing brought the whole presentation to an end. Such theaters were part of the regular repertoire of entertainment in Oyo cities and towns. Theater groups, known as Alaranjo, traveling entertainers, accompanied by drummers, dancers, singers, acrobats and mascots, all from the Oyo country, were regularly to be found on tour in all parts of the Oroboland and the Oyo Empire. The Oyo homeland in the era of the Oyo Empire, then, was a land of great and dynamic culture. Its huge cultural outflow played a very important part in promoting the image and influence of the Alafan in the rest of Yoruba land and much of West Africa. The royal festival named Bibi served as occasion to put on show the beauty of Oyoila and the glory of the Alafan and Oyoila chiefs. Celebrated by the Alafans who reigned long or whose reigns were judged by them and their chiefs to be successful and prosperous, Bibi was the biggest and loudest royal festival ever designed by any Yoruba kingdom. At its best. It was an ambitious royal jubilee supposed to last a full ten years, during which rulers and chiefs of the Oyo homeland, vassal rulers and chiefs from all the tributary states of the empire, very senior messengers of kings of other Yoruba kingdoms, ordinary citizens, rich and poor, from all over Yoruba land and the Oyo empire, were invited to converge on Oyoila, to honor the Alafan and give gifts to him, to bask in the greatness and beauty of Oyoila and gaze with awe at the palace and its great king, to join in mammoth dancing celebrations and parades and to partake of the surpassingly rich hospitality of the Alafan's government and royal city. The Alafan and his kingdom, sitting atop a sprawling and prosperous empire, took the beauty of Yoruba civilization to very great heights.